good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Kinga Sering, uh, still from uh, Bhutan. <laughs> and nice to, have, nice to have all of you back um, uh, after the opening ceremony. Um, so today, it's a great honor for me to greet all of you with uh, stellar star performers and experts in the uh, world of happiness and connected to Bhutan and uh, GNH. So we have a very, very interesting uh, panel session for this morning. Um, I just, I'll just go over some few sort of um, housekeeping rules. So I will introduce our honorable speakers very briefly because if, um, I hope everyone has got the program booklet and the bio, everything in detail is there. So I'll keep the introduction very brief. I will request each of the speakers to talk for about seven to 10 minutes. And with the concurrence of some of the honorable speakers, I have requested if our uh, Chairman Dasho, who has traveled all the way from Bhutan. So the criteria was the furthest distance and the smallest country. So he gets to speak for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hope that's, I hope that's okay for you to make him happy. Um, so after that, we will, um, so we will have a timekeeper as well. Can I, Dave, can you please stand up? And uh, so he will be showing three minutes, two minutes, one minute, just to get our honorable speakers on the time. Uh, after the honorable speakers have finished speaking, then uh, I will pose a few questions and then also request them to also, maybe if they have uh, some pressing questions for each other to, to exchange that. And then we will open up for questions from all of the honorable audience members here today, because I think it's really about uh, each and every one of you who has braved the Saturday morning rain to be here with us today. So uh, with this, the panel session theme is actually uh, governing for happiness. And as a matter of fact, I borrowed, we borrowed it from Professor Sophos Renath, who has got a case study on Bhutan, which is teachers at the HPS. So I will be mentioning that as we introduce him. And also the Bhutanese uh, statecraft and the spirit of uh, gross national happiness, uh, for which we have Dr. Karma sharing with us his experiences in the gross national happiness. And also we have as part of the spirit of gross national happiness, something related to Buddhism, because we have our predominant religion in Bhutan is Buddhism, 80%, and we have Hindu and then Christian as well. And Professor um, Wolfgang is there with us. And also we have Professor John Hallowell, who is the editor of the World uh, Happiness uh, Report, which has just come out uh, for in on March uh, 28th. And we have copies of the happiness report, but this is the 2018 version. And the simple reason is because we couldn't get enough copies for 2019, and uh, I think Bhutan has climbed up only two places, so we do not. Uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, there, there are some copies of 2018 and 2017, which uh, Professor's office has kindly shared with us. So if anybody uh, would like to take copies of those, that will be available. So with this uh, few ground rules and the theme for the panel discussion, uh, let me first introduce to you Dasho Karmat Sittim. Um, uh, for I think those of us who have been at the uh, opening ceremony, uh, the keynote speaker, Madam uh, Doma Sering, has already uh, introduced uh, Dasho, uh, who has been the leading GNH uh, practitioner in Bhutan. He's chairman of the Royal Civil Service Commission, so that is the entire bureaucracy in Bhutan. And Dasho and his commission has actually coined the term from bureaucracy and bureaucrats to bureaucraft. So I think these are some of the uh, terms which has come out of GNH and bureaucraft as well. Dasho has been secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission, which is like the planning equivalent to planning commission. So again, to reinforce the lens of GNH uh, in Bhutan. Uh, Dasho was appointed the chairman of the Civil Service Commission in 2014 and also awarded the Red Scarf in 2015 by His Majesty the King of Bhutan. So if you had noticed again during the ceremony, uh, I was wearing a white scarf and Dasho was wearing a red scarf. So that red scarf is an honor scarf from, received from His Majesty the King. So with this, may I invite uh, Dasho to kindly share your presentation. Thank you. 
Very good morning. Thank you very much, Kinga, for that kind uh, introduction. So I believe I have 15 minutes, not a moment to waste. What I will do is talk about uh, what the pursuit of happiness as an overarching development goal entails. OK? Uh, the whole journey started when, uh, when the words GNH, Gross National Happiness, is more important than GDP. And these words were uttered by uh, no other than His Majesty, the fourth King of Bhutan, who was running the affairs of the country, literally on a day-to-day -day basis. And that really began the journey of pursuing happiness as an overarching development goal. Uh, until 2008, when we enacted a constitution and we became a democratic constitutional monarchy, there was actually no definition of gross national happiness because the architect, the author of the philosophy was himself running the affairs of the country. But in 2008, when we became a democratic constitutional monarchy and now we're going to have plur plurality of players, then we felt the need to define. And that's when the work of developing the Gross National Happiness Index began. So basically, in terms of pursuing happiness as an overarching goal, based on my experience as the first secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission, there were three things we did. First, we had to break down the philosophy to, to an index that could be used to gauge and guide Bhutan's development. And so that's how we created the Gross National Happiness Index. We saw at that time that all the other development indicators, indexes, were insufficient to capture this idea that came from His Majesty, the fourth king. We had the UNHDI, we had GDP, but we found all this inadequate in terms of capturing what really matters and what should be the pursuit of good governance. Uh, second, we carried out periodic surveys these surveys are rather long. In fact, the original survey took about four hours to complete. I gather a couple of respondents fainted. <laughs> it must have been tough. I think the surveys must have made them miserable. Uh, the second, that was in 2010. The second survey in 2015, it was reduced to about 25 pages. But you still have to answer about 200 questions. I took that during the long break I had in my flight here. And I realized that it is still something which will make you quite miserable. Uh, but these surveys, which are carried out across the country, is a huge exercise. It takes almost between three to six months. And these give us an idea of where we are heading in terms of our desire to, to enhance gross national happiness. So that was the second thing we did, carried out surveys uh, based on the GNH index to gauge and guide our development. And the third thing we did is to come out with what we call a policy screening tool. Because what is the role of government but to influence its citizens for pro-social behavior? That's why we have taxes, right? Not only for equitable district, uh, distribution, but to make sure that, that uh, we incentivize people to do what will promote the greater good for as many as possible. So, so for that, we created this policy screening tool, which is nothing but a tool based on the GNH index. And we literally put this on like lens, a pair of GNH lens, to look at policies. So irrespective of whatever policy, we use this lens to evaluate those policies. So these are the three things, and I thought I'll just highlight briefly the GNH index because that is the, the base which informs all these other tools we use as part of the bureaucraft to try and achieve happiness for the Bhutanese population. So the GNH index is made up of nine domains. So in Bhutan, of course, many people feel, or the perception they have is Bhutan, or oh, the happiest country. And we are no different from any other country. And as a government, we will never pretend that we are literally trying to put smiles on people's faces. Because that's not what we are literally trying to do. Because we, are, we always recognize that happiness at the individual level must remain the responsibility of individuals. What can the government do through policies? Create the right conditions. Conditions which will allow people to find happiness. 
hopefully, conditions. And these conditions could be in a variety of ways. So we look at creating the right conditions in nine domains. And we feel those nine domains ca capture all the areas that are critical to al en allow and enable uh, people to have the best opportunity of flourishing, fulfilling themselves. So what are these nine uh, domains? Five of the nine domains are very much areas which are primary considerations for any country. Health, because good health is critical for happiness, right? Education, without education, I think there's no question of unleashing one's full potential. The third, um, living standards, that covers food, clothing, shelter, unemployment, keeping it low, so on and so forth. Uh, fourth, ecological diversity and resilience, the natural environment, so important critical, and I think only today we are realizing how important it is to sustainability and flourishing. Uh, but this was on our agenda as far back as 1972 when His Majesty the Fourth King pronounced those words. Environment was one of the four pillars. Fifth, good governance. Good governance, well, I'm sure you know, but for those who don't, critical and strongly related or to happiness. If you have poor governance, it's very difficult to be happy. You turn on the TV, you start getting miserable. <laughs> so, so good governance itself, whether it's corruption, the leadership, the public services, critical. But these five areas, I would say, are areas which are primary considerations for every government. But the other four areas out of the nine areas that make up the GNH index, they are actually quite innovative. And we feel that they are even as important, if indeed, if not more important than the five domains I just mentioned. But they are the domains which actually get no attention from the government. So what are those four domains? One out of the four, community vitality. All happiness research, and frankly speaking, we don't need research for a lot of this. You can just reflect on your own lives. What makes a happy life? It's, health, it's, uh, it's your Friendships is the depth and quality of relationships you have, whether it's your family, your friends, or the community in which you live, so critical. Um, so that's uh, one domain. The next, cultural diversity. So you see us very proudly wearing our national dress. We wear this like you wear suit to work. And and not only that, culture is, this is just one aspect or one facet of culture. There are so many facets. If you come to Bhutan, you'll notice our architecture is very traditional and our cities look very different because we have zoning rules which, uh, which ensure that our uh, architecture, traditional architecture thrives. But also the other aspects of culture, uh, culture for instance, social etiquette. You must have seen this morning, we did a lot of bowing that's actually to build harmony. It's difficult to be upset with somebody when they come with a smile on their face and bow to you deeply <laughs> and truly and honestly. Very critical and we, sh we, we cannot, uh, um, you know, um, underestimate the importance of these aspects because they build the fabric of strong societies. Indeed, these are important because they provide the basis of our identity. And again, I think all literature on happiness shows that you must have a strong sense of identity to, to really be happy. Otherwise, what do you do? You buy labels and wear the labels outside, and that's how we try to get some identity going, I guess. But that can be quite empty and uh, not really uh, deeply beneficial to you in the long run. So cultural diversity and resilience, critical uh, domain because it's the foundation of our identity. Then the remaining two, um, and what are the remaining two? Anyone knows? I'm buying time, my memory is getting bad. Time use. Why is time use important? In fact, in the Gross National Happiness Outlook, I have always gone around saying that time is not hours or second on a clock. It's our very lives. And if you look at time as life, you start making very different choices. Actually, choices which will make you happier. 
So many times I ask people, what's most important to you? And they talk about their relations, their family, their parents, aging parents, so on and so forth. And then you ask them, how do you spend your time? And it's all Facebook, etc. <laughs> and I tell them, that's a recipe for unhappiness. Because the happiness recipe is where you align the use of your time, which is your life, to what you care about. So time extremely, extremely important. And so as a domain, one of the nine domains, what does the government do to promote, promote balance time use? So we actually have legislation saying that uh, you know, eight, eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of, I guess, sleep. Any other pattern would be unsustainable, right? And that's what we try to promote. So even uh, uh, in the civil service where I uh, worked as the chairman, I always talk about this idea of working smart. Don't work hard, work smart. If you work smart, nine to five, Monday to Friday, more than enough time to get everything done. After that, go out, make the most of your life. Spend it in quality ways so that then you come back and again you are able to serve the organization well because you come back fully charged. So critical. And what's the ninth domain, the last domain? Psychological well-being. Why is psychological well-being important? In a sense, this is almost like an outcome of, uh, because you can almost, uh, well, you can say that highest, better states of psychological well-being is equated to, to happiness. But also because psychological well-being is actually about the spiritual half that exists, that makes us as persons. And uh, like the physical half that we give three meals and sometimes probably more meals than that, the spiritual half also actually needs nourishment, but we ignore it. And, and actually, when you ignore the nourishment of your spiritual half, uh, again, it's not a recipe for happiness. And so under that, we actually uh, look at things like meditation. And indeed, based on a survey, we showed that on the indicator of meditation, very few Buddhist people meditate. On the other hand, we know the strong correlation between meditation, greater mindfulness, and therefore greater happiness. We introduce meditation in all our schools. So these nine domains guide what the government does. These are the nine domains and the indicators underlying it are what we measure through this periodic service. And a subset of the indicators from these nine domain make up the GNH lens that I mentioned we use for reviewing policies and is serious business. If policies viewed with the GNH lenses do not pass a certain threshold, the government does not accept it. The policy is rejected. We have passed many policies successfully with these tools like education policy, economic development policy, but some policies have persen persistently failed to meet the GNH criteria. For instance, the mineral developing policy. And so what it tells the sector is we'll pass those policies only when you are able to pass and meet the GNS threshold. What is the value of this? I thought my, that would be the last point I can make. The value of this GNS policy screening tool, which makes you have a conversation on all, on all indicators under the, under the nine domains, irrespective of what the policy focus is, is critical. It is actually getting you to look at all the trade-offs that exist, so that when you make a choice, you make the best choice. I think decision-making theory shows that decisions are heavily influenced by the framework you use to make them. So if you make an economic decision using just an economic framework, it may be good, very, very good economically, but maybe that's why we have all the problem of climate change and so on and so forth, because we never had a comprehensive framework that looked at the true trade-offs. And that's the value, the holistic framework of, uh, of GNH and, uh, and uh, how it uh, helps policymakers make decisions. As a result of all this, I am hopeful that uh, the chances of our citizens finding uh, hopefully happier and more fulfilling li lives will be higher. I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karma, for giving us a very, very succinct but a comprehensive overview of the uh, state craft of uh, gross national happiness uh, in Bhutan. Um, and especially, I think, uh, uh, 
uh, if you make the surveys too long, uh, it makes people unhappy. And uh, so I think we'll find out more about that. Uh, Professor John is always lo already looking at me. <laughs> um, but there's another thing that Dasha hasn't shared with us. Um, I suppose I'll make this as part of a follow-up question as well. Um, one thing is, at the village level, uh, there is also a joke that Tasho was uh, actually shared earlier with us saying that in Bhutan, name is in some ways a very common thing, in some ways very special and unique to everybody, right? So Kaka is Kaka, and a lot of people ask him why you have only one name. <laughs> and uh, the GNH version of uh, uh, translation in Bhutan is uh, Geliom Gakipenzom, so which is also a name of uh, a very, very uh, you know, attractive ladies and, and women in Bhutan. And I believe when you ask in the, the question to, in, in some of the villages, they said, oh, we have heard about her, but never seen her. So I, <laughs> I just wanted to probe Dasho on that. Uh, how is the practice of the whole GNH lens at the governing level, uh, in your exp experience, translated at the village, local, and individual level? Well, at, at the local level, of course, they do not have deep knowledge of the nine domains and the 33 indicators and the policy screening tool. Those are really tools for bureaucracy people like us to use. At, at the local government level, but however, they have a very clear idea that gross national happiness is built on the four pillars. And this, uh, uh, this four pillars was something we came out with when we deconstructed in 2008 to figure out, uh, to define GNH and come out with the GNH index. We had to look at what the fourth king did. So when we looked at the fourth king's action, what characterized his reign, uh, we saw that there were four pillars. And, and so that's why you hear in older literature about GNH, about the four pillars, sustainable and socioeconomic development, uh, conservation of the environment, preservation and promotion of our culture and traditions, and good governance. To this level, even local uh, leaders, local people have awareness. But beyond that, what I mentioned, the nine domains, that is actually what we are using as a planning body to allocate resource, come out with interventions to create and improve condi uh, conditions. Uh, one thing I would like to say, and uh, this is something uh, that uh, a gentleman, now I don't know where he is, he's a lecturer somewhere, but he did one of the more in-depth studies on GNH. And uh, what he found in that study, and I, I, I agree with uh, his uh, findings, uh, which is that, that we were quite good in the articulation of gross national happiness. We were quite clever in the way we broke it down into the domains and the indicators. But in terms of our, our policy uh, interventions to realized policy intentions, it was quite weak. And yet he saw in those four case studies that he did that the outcomes were still very consistent with policy intervention, uh, intentions, even though the tools we had were not so good. And uh, he uh, came to the conclusion that the reason is because the underlying values, the values that underlie this whole GNH is shared by Buddhists because it's informed and influenced heavily by Buddhism. So since the the many actors had the same values, so the outcomes sort of aligned, even though in between the instruments were not that uh, clever. Uh, so um, that's uh, what I would like to share that. Yes, the knowledge up to the type of details I shared is not there, but at least up to these four pillars and the underlying value, that is shared quite widely. And I think that's why we see that uh, some success with whatever we try to do. Plus, thank you, thank you, Dasho. So I think, uh, the threat of, I guess, uh, value that uh, every community level and local level are a very important component of the happiness uh, principle and philosophy. I would like to next move to Professor Sofa Surinat from the Harvard uh, Business School. Uh, professor is, to me, I think, uh, very inspiring and uh, well known and popular for his very popular course, may I say, governing for happiness because of the case study on Bhutan. <laughs> no, actually it's a, it's a very uh, popular course on globalization in emerging market with uh, 25 countries. And it's a fascinating uh, course, uh, enjoyed every minute of it. 
And uh, Professor has done a very, very thorough and comprehensive, comprehensive study on Bhutan. And his case study is called The Governing for Happiness on Bhutan. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure and honor, Professor, to welcome you and share with us uh, your views. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Do you mind if I sit here? Uh, Thank you, Kinga. Kinga gave me seven minutes, so I'll try to stick to that. Um, now, as should be evident, I'm not Bhutanese, and I sleep less than eight hours a night. Um, <laughs> I'm, in fact, Norwegian, um, and Norway has sort of a history of caring about happiness. And for those of you who know any Norwegians, it's sort of surreal that again and again, Norway is declared one of the happiest countries in the world, when every single Norwegian has this deep, dark soul. <laughs> and, <laughs> There is a tension there that has driven, I think, my curiosity, at least, with regard to Bhutan and happiness and meaning of life and all these things. Now, um, taking a step back, why on earth am I here? There are not that many avenues for collaboration between the business school and the divinity school. Um, lo and behold, shouldn't surprise many. You know what sort of gods we worship there. Um, <laughs> but I must say, only a couple of weeks ago, I found myself in a divinity school for a very particular reason, namely, there was no other library at Harvard where you could find the complete works of Karl Marx. And there are many things one can make of that, but the most important thing I'd like to communicate is that we all know, somehow, that capitalism, the way it's been pursued for the past few decades, is simply not sustainable. We are at the crossroads. We're all in the middle of rethinking how to engage with this. We have new courses on reimagining capitalism that are now increasingly popular at the business school, and we sort of need to engage with the world in new ways. And that's how I essentially came to um, Bhutan. I, mean, I, I had to teach for first year HBS students um, a, a course in macroeconomics, and we teach national economic accounting, we teach GDP accounting. And in a way, um, we quickly, you know, students quickly realize that they're, they're quite obvious costs and benefits to GDP. It's extremely useful for very particular things. It's elegant, it's comparable, it's really powerful. But then it also has these clear drawbacks. If you bomb a country and rebuild all its cities, that's great growth. And clearly there's something that isn't quite measured properly there. Um, and say if, you know, the entire sectors of the economy that are not noticed, like housework. So if I were to marry my pool boy, GDP would go down. I mean, I don't have a pool or a pool boy, but the, exact, the, the point is there are all these important human activities that somehow aren't taken into consideration. So I ended up always concluding my class on GDP by reading um, a quote by our local Bostonian Bobby Kennedy, um, who quite eloquently explained, gross national product does not allow for the health of our children the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our will, wit or our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. So my entire, I realized my entire course on GDP was to undermine the concept as much as I could. And I thought, how to find alternatives? And Bhutan was the obvious alternative at the time. This was, and I've been teaching this case for about seven years. Um, more than 700 students have taken my, my case on Bhutan. Um, and I thought it would be useful to say just a few words about what my lessons have been of teaching this case on Bhutan to 700 MBA students. Um, and there, there are sort of themes that occur and repeat themselves. You may not know what the case is. So a case is a document like this. It's usually 15 pages of prose analysis of a country followed by 15 pages of statistics. Inevitably, GDP will be exhibit number two following the map, which is exhibit number one. And all cases begin with some person, usually a dude, looking out a window, <laughs> contemplating <laughs> some major decisions. We call these decision points. I tried to be inventive and say he was staring into a wall. You know, there are ways of trying to make... Students read hundreds of these, so after a while you need to get their attention. But 
the decision point of the Bhutan case was quite straightforward. It was, given the conditions of Bhutan, should they dam this big river to get electricity, to get light into households and to export electricity to India to get you know, foreign exchange, or should they not? Because if they dammed the river, they might, it might lead to the extinction of a rare heron. And it was a way of, sort of simplifying the dichotomy, GDP, G&H, and students inevitably um, are divided by this as a point of a decision point. It's meant to give you good examples to you know, bolster different kinds of arguments. Um, students tend not surprisingly, to think in sort of Meslovian terms, that there's a hierarchy of needs, and Bhutan needs electricity for households at this point more than it needs those extra herons. But it's always a tortuous sort of dilemma. Um, but it reaches the, it really underlines the one main takeaway that all students get, get by this, which is to quote the, Her Excellency this morning, the necessity of a more holistic look at life and essentially the entire system with which we operate. We need to take care not only of my pool boy but the environment and all these other ways of looking at things are essentially not even an option, they're a necessity at this point in our global development. Um, they also, however, um, do tend to highlight some drawbacks. And they were evident even in the discussions this morning between the Dean and, and Her Excellency, um, in that the Dean spoke very importantly of inclusion. And we've heard the word community repeatedly. Um, students always pick this up. Whose happiness are we really looking out for, given our consideration is for making the world a better place? Even the motto of HBS students is, to teach people to make a difference in the world, you know, to ideally a, a good difference. I mean, there, could, there are many ways of making a difference, but I <laughs> take that for granted. The, the original motto was even better. It was um, to teach um, um, decent people to make a decent profit decently. Um, it was clearly <laughs> too quaint, and now we're making a difference. But students do see that there are ways of making differences that have different operate on different levels of a society. We have the world, we have the community of humanity, we have the community of Bhutan, and we have the communities of, of individuals who also have been raised often. And there are times when happiness for the community may not necessarily be happiness for the individual, whether that is a minority of some sort, or a, a refugee, or there, there are many forms of communities. And though clearly GNH is something the world needs to take seriously, no, there are no perfect systems, and they're all works in progress. You may not notice, but you certainly there's no reason any of you should notice. But the first attempt at measuring welfare was an 18th century affair, long before GDP. And it was put together by an 18th century Welshman named Henry Lloyd, who said, the way to measure the welfare of polities is to add up population plus taxation and then divide by a million. Now, clearly you learn that, yes, France is better than Portugal by those terms. But clearly there are also many things you lose out on these things. These measures are always, as the critique at the time was, at times somewhat crude and absurd. It's a process of learning. And we're all embarking on this together, which is why I'm so delighted that we're putting this excellent conference together to really think seriously about really what is the most important thing in life. And I think the ultimate takeaway for my students is that, and my own working in Bhutan, I guess, is that Maslow didn't just give us a hierarchy of needs. He gave us a very neat metaphor that many claim Wittgenstein came up with. But if everything you have is a hammer, then most things start looking like nails. And Bhutan is, I think, the best reminder to all of us that we can have more than one tool in our toolkit. We cannot just have the hammer of GDP. We, we may not want to entirely discard the hammer of GDP, but we need to be conscious of the spectrum of tools that public policy needs to domesticate 
for the pursuit of happiness, not merely for individuals and communities, but indeed for humanity as such. I believe that was exactly 10 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>
come from there or study that. We have the 13th of April, 2019 today. Uh, does that ring a bell, that date? Okay, so today is the 100th anniversary of the Amritsar massacre, the most important of the anti-Indian, anti-fuel Congress or Indian independent movements uh, by the British crown that moved in the garden of Amritsar. And um, there were a peaceful assembly of 1,000 200 to 1,600 people, and the uh, British opened fire without warning, targeting everybody, women, children, and the men, within two minutes of moving in. They had some machine guns, and when uh, uh, Colonel Dyer, who commanded them, was later asked why he didn't put the machine guns in, he said, because the doorways were too small. If they would have been wider, of course, I would have used them, because it is important to teach these people a lesson. Why am I mentioning this, other than that this is a very important date for that part of the world? What we know from the investigations later, and also of the lieutenant governor of the Punjab, a guy by the name of O'Dwyer, who was actually the main perpetrator, is that these people were actually absolutely sure that they were improving the situation in the Punjab, that they did the right thing, that they had all the theory, that they had all the ethics on their side. These are people to whom you can't leave voting because they don't know what it really means. Mind you, this is, this is India. And it's people coming from Britain where we see today how, well, okay, never mind, but um, uh, in, in the end, you know, the, the Gandhian point to say that Western civilization would be a good idea is not entirely frivolous a statement, yeah? And that is very important before I start talking about Bhutan because one of the most interesting things for me is the strange tension between Bhutan and gross national happiness as a PR tool, as something towards the outside, and also as something to be packaged for the world, you know, for a better world, for us. Can we transfer Bhutan as it is into our lives and what it means in the inside of Bhutan? Now, of course, gross national happiness completely changed. The history of this is not written, but it meant something completely different when the fourth king phrased it, but even during the last decades, during the various prime ministerships, it really changed its meaning. So there is no such thing as the GNH, but you would have to talk about which one it is. But why I was mentioning um, the Amritsar story, I do think that in the end, it is up to the Bhutanese to decide what the GNH is. But of course, being an academic, that said, I will now offer my interpretation of it, but with this caveat that in the end, I would find it more than legitimate, but actually ideal, if the Bhutanese don't listen to people who look like me. Because lesson of world history in the last 100 years is if you do that, there may be an issue. Yeah? So I think that overall, my main area is governance and actually public management, where Bhutan has stuck to its own traditions and, as, as we would say at the government department, upgraded themselves. That means became a better version of themselves rather than adopting Western principles and packaging the happiness in such a way that it is Western compatible, that has been a success, whereas the takeover of Western reforms has not always been as successful as would have been desirable. And I phrase it that friendly because I'm sitting next to you. Um, yeah, so this is, this is an Im important thing here. On the other hand, let me say very clearly, it is not frivolous to say that Bhutan is so much better known and so much more loved by the world because of GNH than would be logical for a country of that size and sandwiched between India and China, both of which have a track record of taking over little countries in the Himalayas just because they want to. Not only China, but also India. This is an important story for the Bhutanese context. The word for this is Sikkim. Yeah. And, um, but what you see over the time is this shift of the meaning of GNH inside and outside. And in a certain sense, I think it is fair to say, not everybody agrees, that it has become all the more scientific, all the more Western compatible and um, sellable in a certain sense. But, um, and that is not a bad thing for, for various reasons, but on the other hand, you know, this is one of these public policy, international public policy tensions that we can't really solve. What is more important, global standards, we are all one humankind, 
or saying we do respect the local context first of all and we think about whether we should really not engage in some high quality shut uppery from the western side if before we give moral lessons to other places because the track record of that is so catastrophic. Now, if I look at the genesis of GNH in context, and this is what, what uh, Dasho Kinga kindly mentioned as one of my main interests, and indeed it is, then what we see is that GNH is not as unique as it is sometimes mentioned, neither by its time nor by its context, but it is a typical mid-70s form of Buddhist economics. That is when Buddhist economics really go back to center stage also in the West. Many of you will know the book by K.F. Schumacher, yeah, small is beautiful. And that then reverberates back to Asia and gets into the context of Buddhist economics that is not the Buddhism as such, but a very, very specific form of it with you know, ecology, sustainability, villages, happy villages, and so on and so on. It's usually focused on agriculture, not on industry. That is different in different ways, but Buddhism as such is not about agriculture. Yeah? But the way it emerged then and what we today understand as Buddhist economics is that. And uh, classic other examples um, is um, uh, today still the um, uh, um, sufficiency economy in Thailand and also the unification of king and people in Jogjakarta, which is shocking to many because that comes from a sultan. And how can be a sultan a Buddhist king? But yes, it's possible even if some absolutists don't like it. Um, Back then, Schumacher based it actually on a, on a, on a non-monarchical case. Oh, God, three minutes. That really kills me. So uh, how, how can I run through that? Ask me some good questions later that I can really finish. Um, Buddhist economics like that are based on a definition of happiness that it doesn't make you happy to get what you want, but that you manage what you want. Yeah? That you reduce your wants beyond that what you really need. No Buddhist economics says you shouldn't have clean water. But do you really need the last version of the iPhone? Actually, in my opinion, you shouldn't need iPhone at all. But you know, if you go for the iPhones, then don't go for the last one. This kind of thing of ostentatious behavior, mass consumption, and so on, does not make you happy. And the logic in the Buddhist economic system is that there is a moral authority, empirically almost always a genuinely trusted Buddhist monarch, the so-called Dhammaraja, that fills that provides a space within which you can find your dharma um, that allows that. So there is a logical combination between the two. And the GNH is originally envisioned, I think, is this. If it's a form of Buddhist economics, let me acknowledge the elephant in the room that is an issue for those in these countries who are not Buddhists and not part of that system. That said, it also means that the system is not as transferable as you think. We have this big industry trying to secularize, popularize, and westernize Buddhism, you know, the, what they call the yoga mat approach to Buddhism, um, in order to sell it better. But if we are serious about that, which I think in the divinity school we can be, and we can say that this is a form of Buddhist economics, it needs a government setup also that is not really transferable. So what I think we can do, and what I find interesting about the GNH, is it's not interesting where it's scalable. It's interesting where it's different. It's interesting where it reminds you of our priority. It is interesting where it says the global Western context is not everything there is. We can do things differently. We cannot transfer the Bhutanese GNH to anywhere else, but we can learn from it. It's policy learning, not policy transfer that we want. We can learn the prioritizations. We can work the questions. We may emulate, as uh, Sophos talked about in a multi-award winning book about policy emulation, economic emulation. And I think this is where the greatness comes. No fear of what is different, but an embracing on it, which makes us reflect on what our priorities actually are. And in this one, Bhutan is the country in the world that makes us question of whether we made the right decisions in our priorities or not. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, uh, so I need to regret about the time. I know that uh, what
No, no. Uh, a disclosure, um, I have been also yesterday privileged to be at one of the sessions at the Tijan School of Health uh, where a professor was speaking. And I feel that uh, this may not be a good question, but as a follow-up, I wanted you to share with us uh, basically a summary of, from what I hear yesterday, was actually that we should not go into measurement and indices, and that's not what actually JNH is all about. Would you clarify on that? In how many minutes? I give 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. No, no, no. I, I, I mean, think we have That's, what, that's my, my job. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the famous thing, like what the German professor says before he speaks, he says, before I start speaking, let me say a few words. Yeah. Oh. This kind of thing. I mean, this is like, uh, I, I do that for a living, right? That's, that's a great quote, isn't it? Um, this is one of the cheap takeaways from here. Okay, the, the, the great conference we have, and uh, Vish, thank you so much for arranging it. It was a brilliant program of health and happiness in the, in the Chan School, of bringing that together and how to operationalize it, and how to be data-driven on these things. Again, what is interesting, and let me just put it on the GNH thing where you see the difference. It starts, the GNH starts also as a suspicion of quantification of the idea of a numerically informed life, of numbers that have an authority beyond human interpretation. This is what the stats say, and therefore we must do that. And what prevents policy from doing that? And that you are forced by um, indices. I think this goes, this builds a great bridge to John's uh, later presentation, Absolutely. exactly because that's one of the main issues you are grappling with and that we've been discussing about the relativity of indices and that you know, the relevance of statistics is created in human interaction. Numbers as such do not speak to us. This is, this is a recognition in this context. And then what happens with the GNH is that it becomes more and more numerical, more and more quantitative in a certain way mirrors the GDP or, or, or uh, uh, GNP, that, that from saying we don't want to give any numbers, it comes to, um, yeah, but we kind of have to. We live in one world. We do not live in a world in which you can justify public policy without giving numbers. Yeah? Um, up to where it is now, where you have a one number index. Yeah, Bhutanese happiness is one number with a lot of digits after the comma. And that means it goes up and down, whereas some people might say happiness means not living according to indices. Yeah? And that is, that is a serious question, also on the policy level. And for me, what my point was, is this is exactly this tension. I think if you have decision-making authorities that you trust and that make decisions beyond the numbers, Think about doctors. We have an analysis of our health. This is there, but you still want an experienced doctor to specify it down to you. You don't actually want the computer to design your therapy, even if this is where it's coming. And I think this is very important on the policy level as well. Um, but uh, the tension, again, is there. The tension between the two. You need to justify through numbers but on the other hand, there is the problem with numbers and basing everything on numbers. And in a sense, Bhutan has gone the way towards quantification, um, whereas I found the, the early time of rejecting the numbers uh, and saying, no, no, we, we don't do it. We don't play your game, guys. Uh, more fascinating for, also for the rest of us, but I do understand in the world, Bhutan is not a country that can say no to international transfers and transfers from India. And they will require, as I was told, they will require statistics, even if they are made up. They're not made up in Bhutan. But the donors would say, yeah, write something, but we need some numbers. Seriously, this is not a joke story. And so I understand that since we live in a world that privileges quantification and indicators, that we have to go there. On the other hand, the more you go back on that, the, as much as you can, the better it would be. The unique case is, and you may dismiss that or not, that this is also part of Buddhist economics because the idea of the Dhammaraja is that there is a special access to reality that does not necessarily need artificial quantification to get the kind of information that you would have in other systems. But I know that not many people will go along that road. I'm just telling that this is part of that economic system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for, for sharing that. Yeah, let's give it a
Um, so as you have indicated, I think, uh, and also a lot of our professor remind us that a good question is always followed by and answered by the next slide. In this case, it's not the next slide. We have our next speaker, Professor John Hallowell, who will be, I suppose, answering quite a few of those questions on numbers and indices. Uh, Professor uh, John Hallowell, Professor Emeritus of the Canadian Institute for Advanced uh, Research, C4, Program on Social Interactions, Identity, and Wellbeing. Professor has been, among so many other things that he has done, um, right now is uh, spearheading as the editor of the World Happiness Report, which has just come out, and I had the honor of attending the big launch day in uh, New York on March uh, 28th. And Professor also has been to uh, Bhutan, and I believe uh, we'll be heading there next uh, month as well mm -hmm. to, to look at um, urbanization and, and, and gross national happiness. So without further ado, I just wanted to mention a small thing on Professor John Helwell. I had a friend actually who called me up from Israel saying that I heard Professor John Helwell is coming here to, to speak. And then I managed to meet her in New York. And one thing that sort of really uh, ex uh, sort of exemplifies Professor Helwell and why he's taking on this huge um, responsibility, I suppose, on happiness initiative is she says that He's one of the first few guys who can really make anybody happy just by looking at his face. No. And, uh, I think that's so true. I think. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so with this, Professor, um, if you can please. <laughs> that's good. Are you still happy? <laughs> so the secret is, if you see you're not smiling, all I have to do is smile. Can I speak and smile at the same time? <laughs> What if the things that are important can't be counted, but you need evidence in order to show that? And that's the conundrum you have placed for us, and I'm going to take you through some history as to how I think it, in fact, has worked to some extent, and lots left still to be done. I got in, as the second song we sang this morning indicated, I got into the study of happiness in the 1990s jointly with Robert Putnam and the study of social capital through the following puzzle. If social capital is really important, how can we measure its value uh, in order to get people to take it seriously? And people started seeing whether it affected economic growth. And so is that it, it either affects life deeply or we won't may be able to make a convincing case. So at that time, we discovered there was quite a lot of evidence about people evaluating the quality of their own lives. And I said either this is the most important fact I've run into in decades or it's a sham. And uh, because it, if it's true, it enables economics to go back two centuries and acquire the bread that lost when it got stuck into thinking of material things as being the measure of progress. Because if you can have some judgment about the quality of life, then welfare economics can be an applied science, not just uh, theology as it otherwise is inclined to be. Uh, theology is the wrong word. I meant purely theoretical in the li literature as it was. So by the time uh, the century turned, uh, and, uh, and got to the International Gross National Happiness Conference. I was at the first one in Canada in 2005 and several since. I was very much in that community while also studying uh, happiness and social capital more broadly. Uh, so that when uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister and the Secretary General uh, were responsible for that uh, direction turning resolution in June 2011 before the United Nations that was passed unanimously and to take happiness and well-being as a focus of national policies recommended to the member countries. And immediately after that, a conference was convened, chaired by Jeff Sachs and uh, the Prime Minister in Bhutan. And because of my history, and I was among those invited to uh, a planning session, as it essentially was, uh, for a meeting to be held, a high-level meeting, in April 2012 at the United Nations. 
And at that time, uh, the decision was made in the Prime Minister's office after this uh, two or three day meeting uh, that we should put together a scientific report about what is known in the science of well-being, and what kind of evidence is available, what kind of truths are known or hypotheses are there about what does lead to a better life. Uh, and so th that, that report was written and became, it's important, uh, as the, uh, Her Excellency said earlier this morning, to note that at that April 2012 meeting, well, the World Happiness Report was part of it, it had a double platform. The other was for sustainability. And increasingly now we're trying to mesh those two agendas in a tighter way than has been done before, but it's quite clear it, it has to be done. Now, what happened then was that it adopt, there was quite a take up of the, of the first report and so we felt there was enough take up of it that we should keep doing it and in fact have done ever since. And so what is this, because it was part of, the question is how do you take a basic idea exemplified and essentially made famous by Bhutan. I mean, the credit that goes to Bhutan is enormous. You know, it, it, it's not a, a tourist brand. It's an idea that has infused the world. And this uh, UN resolution and its outflow was clearly seen to be, hoped to be, and turned out to be a critical juncture at doing that. So it essentially took what was an idea and converted it into a global pattern of thought. Well, in order to get further, if you then say what should people in their communities and what should their governments think, you then have to build up a, an, a, a scientific basis that can allow them to make their decisions differently. Uh, but the first thing we had to do was then find out what are the supports for a good life, because after all, policies to deliver it must know what to do. Now, the Bhutanese structure is, is, is great, but it don't tra doesn't, as evidence, it doesn't translate directly. So we, what we do is take these data and use them all over the world to say, what is different in the countries that are happier? What is different among the people within countries who are happier and the cities within countries that are happier? And what, and it turns out those are precisely those things that aren't captured by numbers in the conventional way. So we found essentially six factors that underlie the highest ranking of lives, and I can get back to why you think the, the dark Norwegians aren't happy, because it turns out the Norwegians are very high on all six of these factors, and they'll resonate with you as at least tapping into a space of life that is vital. And two, of course, are the standard development goals of GDP per capita and healthy life expectancy, either necessary or important uh, in supporting uh, a life. Uh, interesting, I entered this field quite explicitly as Aristotle's research assistant. And so <laughs> that's why we were, that's why it's a good job. It, it, he said, Ask someone in a reflective moment to value their life, and he said, here, is, here are my hypotheses about what will be important. So I essentially took all that list and took them to the data, and it turns out, Arist he said, if those do not turn out to match the world as it is, then it's mere theory. And so I said, he needs a research assistant. <laughs> So we did, and he passed with flying colors. Because everyone, the only one that's missing of his items is purpose, and that's just because we don't yet have it in the relevant data. And this is one of those cases where you have to keep asserting something's important, even if you don't have data for it. But beyond those two, the others are really about the social construct of, uh, of, of humanity, social support. Do you have someone to count on in times of trouble? You, you could imagine how that would generalize in many ways. Freedom, do you have freedom to make your key life decisions? This is our doors open, our opportunities open to you uh, writ large. Generosity, Aristotle didn't mention that, but it turns out to be absolutely fundamental. There's a lovely chapter in this year's World Happiness Report by real experts in the field uh, uh, on the power and 
duality of generosity and pro-social behavior, and they're untapped instruments to allow people to build better lives. And finally, the Gallup poll has measures of corruption, but that's a negative measure of trust. But in fact, trust, the, the extent to which your people not just won't cheat, but if you dropped your wallet, they would watch your back, pick up the wallet, and chase you down to give it back. All of those things are things that make people uh, deeply happy. <laughs> And all of those are things that are very high in Norway. All right, now, what has this report done? Uh, well, it turns out, it, and, and I hated the rankings. We didn't have any rankings in the first report, but it turned out I had to count down the list because everybody phoned up and wanted to know what number they were. So now we put numbers beside the country names. But the rankings are only to get people in the room. Then we want them to think about what underlies a good life. So what has happened? Of course, Bhutan has got tourists coming on GNH, but that's not really where these rankings are taking people. They're looking at all the countries, and immediately after, uh, a, 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 a Danish colleague set up the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen, and he's buried in in people coming and wanting to know about the sources of happiness in Denmark. And the same thing is happening in Norway and in Finland, and it's quite appropriate. These are thinkers writing books. These are uh, style leaders saying what's going on there and what are they doing that we can copy. And it turns out, you know, once they get past the giggles and they start looking in the, what the community life looks in these places, you say, oh, he said, that Finnish education system is not just wonderful because they get good marks. That's not the point. It's because they are creating in the way they run the schools and the way they treat their teachers and the way they treat each other in order to prepare people to live happy and fulfilling lives. And so those kind of lessons are being learned by people going off to try and emulate things where they're done to deliver better lives. And a better life is to stop speaking right now because you're... <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor. So as I shared earlier, um, 10 minutes, 10 hours is too uh, less for, I think, what you have in front of you, the whole report on the global happiness ranking. Uh, but we do have some of the old copies available outside as you go out. So please feel free to take them. Um, and Professor, I think a uh, few of the things that you mentioned, one was the the fact that uh, I think through your experiences and uh, realization that it was not, uh, in fact, GNH is not uh, sort of a tourism packaging that uh, you have seen, it's sort of a genuine initiative which uh, uh, now that I think the globally there is a realization that we could uh, make use of some of the things that has been done in Bhutan. Um, I think one of the questions that uh, even in the Global Happiness Report um, that people ask is, I think, um, while it has captured all some of those essence, one thing is, what is your understanding of the cultural differences on when you rank something on the subjective uh, scale? And so some friends, uh, uh, for example, ask me, well, in US, if you ask people, are you happy? And generally, people are more open, and they want to prove that you know we are, yes, I'm happy, I'm doing well. And so you tend to rate yourself seven, uh, seven or eight. Whereas in a culture like Bhutan, Normally, if you offer, even if you offer something, we have to refuse it three times, right? And in the Western concept, I mean, if you refuse three times, then you don't give it to him anymore. But in Bhutan, you have to push the fourth time, fifth time, and then they accept. <laughs> so the, the thing is, uh, it could be a reason where people are genuinely shy and say, oh, I'm not happy, and where's the middle path? Okay, 10, and f 10 plus zero, 10 divided by two, so five is a good number. And I do find that actually in the World Report, Bhutan is ranked five in terms of happiness indices. So any idea on the cultural uh, differences on how it impacts the way how uh, somebody answers on the happiness index uh, question? There are systematic differences across cultures and across uh, 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 continents. Uh, what is astonishing is when you take the data for each country and fit it within that country, the extent to which these human values are the same everywhere. Quite astonishing. Uh, 
but the manifestations I I across nations are very different. You know, actually, the styles, the modes, the social norms, and so on, they really do differ. And some of them are more successful for supporting happy lives than others are. So then, do you then say it's just the way they think of the question differently, or is, in fact, that set of social norms not quite as good as it could be for producing happy lives? And of course, we don't really know because the two are meshed together. But we're trying to sort it out. One of the things that helps to sort it out is to follow through time where those those long-standing norms are sort of constant. And so if things are getting better or worse for particular subgroups and particular aspects of life, then you, you, you've got something holding the other constant. Uh, one of the, there's sort of called a Latin American bubble that, the, that, that in fact the average score, especially on affect yesterday, the sort of a billion joy part, uh, but also on the life evaluations in total, which are supported by the joy. Uh, in Latin America, above what you'd think by looking at those six factors I talked about, and uh, we had a special chapter last year. These reports are online, so you can get them even if the copies run out, out front, on happiness in Latin America by uh, um, uh, Mariano Rojas uh, from Costa Rica. And uh, he went much deeper in terms of the evidence about the structure of family life and the nature of respect and desire there. And it was quite clear in all the dimensions that they did more of it, they wanted more of it. Uh, the three generation families were the choice, not the obligation. Uh, and the, the happiness they got from these warm and tight families was much more than in other countries, because they had comparable measures in other countries. And a good part of that Latin American boost was simply that, once you took account of the fact that that aspect of life was especially well developed and especially, it's valuable everywhere. It was valued even more there and present much more uh, than a good part of that puzzle was explained. Also, there is a East Asian uh, a, a, a departure on the, on, the, on the low side. So once again, is it this question of low answers and so on? Uh, we do find all these things of little bunching at endpoints and, and, and five and some differences, but it turns out they're second order. And of course, in this business, when you start, you're looking for first order ways of making better lives and, and the second order things are of interest, but not an obsession. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I really want to get uh, to all the all wonderful audiences uh, here for the Q&A uh, questions and answers. Um, but uh, before that, um, if you may allow me, um, I don't want to keep the last, say, okay, say your best piece, last two minutes or whatever. I think that puts additional pressure on you to wrap up. So I think before that, before I go to the audience, maybe perhaps um, I would like to provide an opportunity for the honorable speakers to comment uh, uh, each uh, two minutes uh, each on the conversation that has taken place so far, and starting with Professor Rinna. Uh, <laughs> we call this a cold call, where I <laughs> teach. Um, See, um, this is, I get, to, I get to get back to my professors now. <laughs> Yes, um, you taught me. Um, I don't think I ever cold call you, but I will have to get you back for this somehow. Um, <laughs> so the point about subjectivity is, of course, it, at the core of this. And um, I, when I first came here, again being a dark and brooding Norwegian, and you ask people how they're doing, I'm awesome. Everything is awesome. It's like a Lego song, right? Everyone is over the top all the time, and clearly. You can't really just ask people how they feel. And I'm sure you have all sorts of methods for dealing with this. But my personal, the reason I, I'm more like Camus, that if you look for happiness, you'll never find it. I'm, I'm very skeptical about these things temperamentally, because I am sharing my idea of happiness with my students. I have these slideshows, and I, I found a picture that what I wanted to do over break after finally having taught for a year and been up for tenure and all of that, I wanted to walk along a cold Nordic beach. And I found this wonderful image of a man in a coat walking on this snowy beach. And that was my happiness. And it was image number three under depression on Google Images. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, um, 
what makes me happy may not make evidently doesn't make other people happy. And I, I think as a, as a historian, I'm just more attuned to the variety. I'm very, very partial to Wolfgang's take on, on the problem of putting things in numbers. Is, is really, if the moral message of GNH is all you lose from the scientism, then there's just a deep, deep danger of losing something important in trying to make it overly scientific. But Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And as you can see, when you talk about packaging everything, that's what they do best in Harvard Business School. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no. no, I mean the cool Norwegian uh, <laughs> image. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Professor Wolfgang. Well, but I mean, this is, this is a nice key. Um, what I appreciate about this conference and this panel, and if we see it with the conference yesterday as well, is you know, there, there is a lot of emotion in this GNH because for many of us, this is like a breakthrough, the kind of where the world has gone wrong empirically or with wrong values or with wrong systems. And then, of course, um, if Bhutan is that cool, there is a backlash. And if you're you know, in a certain place and you want tenure, you have to write something anti-Bhutanese because everybody has heard the pro-Bhutanese stuff already. It's so popular. Yeah, this is, you, you get this backlash right now. And um, what I've seen is that um, the last, and you know, I don't want to say we are the greatest and the other ones are not, but many of the last both publications or conferences about Bhutan were very one-sided. They were either just really rah-rah and you know, with their own cheerleading crowd or very critical. And uh, most of them very positive, one really has to say. Basically, remember, it's a success story, but it was this or that. What I really liked about this panel and what I really like how, how, how Kinga has done it and what I really like with this audience is that here we really seem to look at the various sides and we, we seem to be able to discuss to say in principle this is great but there is a but and we're not going to put it under the rug. And so also with the quantification because um, you know there is such a thing as data imperialism and there are people who think that over quantifying life is the main problem that we're actually having. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, we're living in a world in which you have to, and so on and so on. So there is, there is so many, oh, shall I say cliche words like ambivalences and ambiguities here, but something like that, right? Um, that altogether this is great, altogether this allows us to reflect, GNH is real once you get through it, even if it shifts through time and space in what it is, it's a moving target to understand. But I think with, with this kind of openness, methodological, um, background-wise, and the de-siloized Harvard that we have here, people who use the bridges over the rivers, yeah, <laughs> that is a great accomplishment already. And so thank you very much for putting this conference on, and we are off to a greatly auspicious start, and I think this is really good. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Honorable Dasho. Uh, well, uh, a conversation on gross national happiness uh, is really about uh, beginning with the end in mind. And I think that's the real value, that, uh, that if you start taking your means as ends, and that's what's happening with just focusing on stock, uh, you know, what's happening on the stock exchange and GDP. At least getting that uh, conversation shift is actually itself, I think, a big nudge in the right direction. I think there are many imperfections, uh, but I, I think those imperfections uh, are uh, less of a problem. Um, the fact that we are staring in, uh, and looking at the right direction is itself, I think, a big uh, plus. And I think that's really uh, what GNH has done. Uh, I wanted to reflect further on what uh, Professor Wolfgang shared that time. I do agree that too much infatuation with numbers uh, not necessarily that, that useful. And indeed, as a planning agency, actually that magical number, the index we made, uh, we w were not actually interested uh, in it. We are actually more interested at the indicator level. At that level, it's actually very useful. And so I would not uh, discount all measures. I think if you don't have measures, accountability is going to be difficult. And we'll have elected uh, leaders who will try to do all sorts of things. And if we now say we will uh, move away from any kind of measures, uh, then I think we might give free reign and 
uh, you know, lose, uh, uh, face, create more problems than solutions. So I do feel that moving into uh, measurement was positive, even though the subject is to do with happiness, and it is quite challenging. Uh, but uh, there are more and more clever ways coming out, uh, uh, thanks to institutes that are in areas like here in Boston. Uh, the other thing I'm helpful is, if you remember what I mentioned, that the more innovative areas are actually the areas which are much more difficult. We, we know they're important, but we don't know about what sort of interventions or conditions we can create. So that is a, a challenge for, I think, those in the business of governance for happiness. And in this regard, I find that the growing um, you know, behavioral sciences, that uh, the knowledge that has come up about biases, about uh, how, you, how you can do nudges, those are actually a very good complement. And actually, now they're giving us an idea about uh, what we can do to get those pro-social behaviors in areas where uh, it's not as simple as making a road. So yeah, I thought I'd just share that. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Very much. One of the charming things about Norwegians is their modesty and humility. Uh, and uh, <laughs> when Norway became top of the well, became top of the list. Some people said, well, that's because of the oil. And we had to remind them, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you're just in there with, the, Norway is not top because of the oil. Norway isn't top in spite of the oil. It's a very rare country that can handle natural resources as beautifully as Norway did. Thank you. And this didn't come from out of the blue. It was in the Norwegian values in the first place. A big lecture we had on this topic was, uh, many years ago, somebody wanted, to, we were looking for examples as to why social capital is so high in those countries. And a, a Norwegian put up her hand in the audience. She said, you know, on a Saturday morning, what happens in Norway is that people go out and they paint each other's houses. It, this idea of doing things with each other, for each other, is just endemic. Uh, and that leads people to think of their lives as successful lives. It's not a question of joy, it's a question of this is a good life. And th th those of us outside witness that and we admire it. And we're grateful for Norway for giving us these kinds of examples that we can follow. Uh, getting back to the, your other point was if, a, if you lose a moral base in a process of quantification, then you've made a deep mistake, and that has to be true. Uh, so I go back to Aristotle here. Uh, if it was true that these measures gave us a purely Epicurean view of life, uh, then that would be a mistaken index. Uh, Aristotle said, you know, I think, in fact, the Stoics and the Epicureans are specialized views, each of which represents part of a true person's life, and that the golden mean involves them both. And indeed, we have found very strong evidence, to my gratitude and, uh, and a bit of surprise, the extent to which people do build morality into their judgments about their own life. For example, we are now finding that to live in a country where there is great inequality makes you less happy than you would have been before, even if you're among the favored. Uh, and it turns out to be even truer where the inequality is inequality of well-being, which I would argue is what's really important, rather than of income and wealth, which is only a, a part of uh, the story. Uh, similarly, uh, people are happy. It, it turns out Americans will sometimes laugh at the idea uh, that was announced by each of the Nordic ambassadors speaking at the UN launch, where they said, you know, people like paying taxes in our country. They appreciate paying taxes. It's their opportunity to pay their share of the services that are trustworthily designed and delivered in the right ways to the right people. And that's the kind of society you want to live in, 
where all the people with whom you work, whether they're in businesses or in government bureaucracies or your neighbors or people you trust, you like, you'd like to share your community and your lives with. And it's something we can all learn something from. Thank you, Professor. I, because of um, time, I won't even, um, I guess, attempt to, to, uh, to summarize because we still have the rest of the day to continue the conversation. Um, but yeah, I think um, as we started off, um, the, at the end of the day is how we make this whole policy and the uh, philosophy, governing values and metrics as accessible as we can at our individual level. And as Professor Renard was sharing in the morning, I think uh, about his story of how he crossed the river and came to the Divinity School. Uh, similarly, we also, in my case, a lot of my friends say, you are at the Kennedy School, why did you, why did you end up at the Divinity School now? And we always share the story that we have, when it comes to car seat belts, the MIT friends have designed it, technically made it, uh, that's a device that obviously saves thousands of lives. Uh, but then again, not to pick on you, Professor, is the HBS who has perfected on how to market it and, and manufacture it. <laughs> this is a joke anyway. And then in comes the Kennedy School and they says the speed limit. So then you don't need the seat belt. But in Bhutan, actually, if you look at the bestseller geography of the bliss, the author says that when you drive in Bhutan, actually, you don't need either because, you know, either speed limit or seat belt doesn't help you at all because the roads are windy, precipitous, and you can fall, in, fall any moment. And when he asked the driver, how do you really drive in a road like this? Then they said, you have to believe in reincarnation. <laughs> so uh, with this, I would like to thank all the honorable speakers. But just to mention that we have a great... Uh, Two panels, again, continuing in the afternoon, uh, moderated by none other than our uh, Dashu Karma here, and then Professor Vish, who has held this terrific uh, uh, workshop yesterday at the uh, Teach Chan School of Health and Happiness. And so we would urge you to stay back after the wonderful and sumptuous lunch. Uh, so with this, uh, before I break off, I would like to request some gifts to be a small memento for our honorable speakers to be handed over.